Well, I see everybody got their clock set appropriately, so uh, no one showed up an, er an hour uh, earlier or late. This is Carl Pilcher broadcasting to you here from the temporary video con room at uh, Car Talk Plaza, excuse me, at the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Um, and I am really, really pleased to be able to introduce Ariel Anbar uh, to present the second uh, NAI Director Seminar. Uh, of the new series. Uh, Ariel has been a member of the NAI and a good friend since uh, the NAI's earliest days. He has done a great deal of service to the NAI and the astrobiology community as a whole in addition to his great research and most recently that service has taken the form of Ariel taking the hopefully not too thankless job of being the <laughs> chair of the Science Steering Committee for the next Astrobiology Science Conference, and he's been doing a fabulous job. Uh, Ariel's work focuses on stable isotope geochemistry of non-traditional geochemical systems like iron and molybdenum, and what he works on is understanding how Earth, and it, how Earth and its biosphere have evolved through time, particularly in the Archean and Proterozoic. And a few years ago, he and Andy Knoll wrote a particularly influential article that was published in Science that focused attention on how unusual uh, the chemistry of Earth, particularly Earth's oceans, may have been during Earth's middle age, uh, about a billion to two billion years ago. And if you haven't read that article, I recommend it to you. Ariel got his uh, bachelor's from Harvard College in 1989 and his PhD in geological and planetary sciences from Caltech in 1996. He was on the faculty of the University of Rochester for about six years before joining Arizona State University, where he is speaking to us uh, from today. And he's going to tell us about something that occurred just at the interface between the Archean and the Paleoproterozoic, a whiff of oxygen before the great oxidation event. And Ariel, take it away. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, I appreciate the generous introduction. After all that, um, although most of my work has focused on iron and molybdenum isotopes, or at least a great deal of it, you're not going to see any of that in this talk here. Um, in fact, it's going to be almost an isotope-free zone, except for a little bit of sulfur isotopes um, that we simply can't resist putting in. Um, I want to uh, stress at the outset that this talk, although I'm giving it, and although I'm going to be featuring primarily research results uh, generated by, by my research group, um, this has been part of a larger collaborative project involving a number of institutions, um, University of Washington, University of Maryland, uh, UC Riverside, uh, University of Alberta, and also MIT and Harvard have had a role in this, and the Geological Survey of Western Australia. So this is truly a collaborative, international collaborative project um, that I'm going to be uh, discussing. Um, and I'm going to be presenting essentially some of the first uh, results from that project. Uh, what this research is all about is trying to better understand the rise of oxygen through time in the Earth's atmosphere. So what I'm showing you here, and my apologies for the delivery here, it's very awkward giving a talk at a computer screen, so hopefully this will come off reasonably well. Um, hopefully you can all see the pointer here. What's shown here is a, it's a cartoon from a Scientific American article by Jim Casting a number of years ago, um, showing uh, a, a sort of a general consensus concept of change in oxygen in the environment through time, in the atmosphere through time. Um, the uh, figure is uh, notably vague on the y-axis, where there are no units whatsoever, um, which is somewhat reflective, actually, um, of the state of knowledge about oxygen uh, through time in the Earth's environment. We know that today we have about 21%, but as we go back in time, there's uh, plenty of room for controversy, even amongst those of us who are pretty convinced that oxygen was very low during the first half of Earth history. Just what does low mean? Does low mean anoxic? Does low mean slightly oxic? Um, there's a very good reason that we don't have units here. Um, what we're going to focus on here is this major initial transition from this world of uh, very low oxygen, running through mo the first half of Earth history roughly, and then there was a sharp change. Uh, this is this this is unitless, but it's essentially a log axis, making this change look uh, very dramatic. It was actually, um, in in uh, uh, linear terms, a relatively small change, but it was a change from a world with very little oxygen to a world with some appreciable fraction of the modern amount, we believe. Um, so this is often referred to as the Great Oxidation Event. So we want to understand more about this event, and I'll go into some more details about what we want to understand as, as we move along. But that's the context of this talk. We're trying to understand issues associated with the Great Oxidation Event. Now, there's been a lot of recent evolution on the topic of oxygen evolution, um, and I list here a series of papers I, that um, 
have come out in the past uh, year and a half or so, um, 2006 and 2007, a number of them quite prominent uh, uh, in nature. Um, and this is by way of illustrating that this is a very vibrant area of research with a good deal of controversy, particularly if uh, you're interested in going into more detail than you'll see in this talk. These two papers here by Omoto et al. and Farquhar et al. Uh, battle back and forth um, about uh, the earliest oxygen record, um, uh, arguing about uh, what was the Archean anoxic or not and what does that really mean. Um, so this work follows on the heels of much of these studies. And what I'm going to focus on are two additional papers that aren't on that list uh, that were published uh, at the end of uh, September in Science. Um, one is titled the same as this talk, A Whiff of Oxygen Before the Great Oxidation Event, and the other, a companion paper, uh, Late Archean Biospheric Oxygenation and Atmospheric Evolution, by, led by uh, Jay Kaufman uh, and his colleagues at the University of Maryland. Both of these studies, uh, uh, the reason they're paired together is because they tell a complementary story about uh, change in environmental oxygenation just before the Great Oxidation Event. And it's particularly appropriate to be talking about this uh, at an NAI director's seminar because this work is the outcome of the NASA Astrobiology Drilling Program. Um, some of you may not be aware that NASA has, and the NASA Astrobiology Institute has a drilling program, but it does. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, this is a picture of the sort of drilling rig that we're working with and the sort of uh, samples that we are obtaining from this drilling program. And this program over the, in 2003 and 2004 um, generated uh, 10 drill cores uh, from Western Australia, all focusing on the period of time before the rise of oxygen and, and various periods of various spans of time before that, trying to get at various questions associated with that first great oxidation event. The two papers I'm going to be discussing here, and in particular, the, the, I'm focusing on the whiff of oxygen paper, um, uh, both are the, represent the first results from the long core, the one kilometer deep core that was drilled in 2004 in the Hammersley Basin. So the 10 cores, one of them in particular, is what we're highlighting here in this study. Now, by way of context, you might ask, well, why is the NASA Astrobiology Institute and NASA more generally interested in drilling old rocks in Western Australia um, and why really there's interest in this oxygen question. And for many of you, this is, this is obvious, but for some, this may not be, especially for students. So it's worth uh, belaboring for just a moment. So what you're seeing here is a cartoon of an extrasolar planet, one of these hot Jupiters, these giant uh, planets um, close to their stars, which are being discovered with regularity these days. Um, amazingly, we can actually sit here and say that uh, to imagine a world like this is no longer an extraordinary thing, because we know of many of them. What is still extraordinary is this data here. This is from a paper in Nature this past year showing what I believe are the first um, uh, spectroscopic data from the atmosphere of such an extrasolar planet. And although these planets are very, very unlikely to be hospitable to life, um, th this sort of data, spectroscopic data, from the atmospheres of uh, extrasolar planets are likely in the next couple of decades to be obtained from planets that are much more like Earth and hence planets that are much more likely to support life. And so the question before us is how would we go about looking for evidence of life on such planets? What would, what would constitute a planetary biosignature on an exoplanet? And such a biosignature would be, uh, uh, reflect, would be something we can measure in the spectra of the atmosphere of that planet. That's the, the most uh, first thing we're going to be able to do, we hope. And um, oxygen features very prominently in that sort of discussion. So what you're seeing here are uh, uh, spectra in the infrared of Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, showing you uh, two things should jump out at you here from this figure. One is that all these atmospheres show a pronounced carbon dioxide uh, band, which is, which is a result of the fact that all of these atmospheres have significant amounts of carbon dioxide. But only Earth shows this, shows this ozone feature. And ozone is a byproduct of the photolysis of oxygen in a planetary atmosphere. And to have ozone in amounts that you can detect like this from space is a reflection of the presence of large amounts of oxygen in um, the atmosphere of a planet. And uh, commonly it's, it's believed, and, and I'm not going to dispute this at all, that if you have such large amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet, you are seeing evidence of life on that planet. And so as a result, it if we want to uh, uh, develop such a concept of how we might look for life in, uh, uh, beyond uh, our solar system, it behooves us to try to understand what controls the amount of oxygen in a planetary atmosphere. If a planet has oxygenic photosynthesis, will it, will it inevitably evolve an oxygenated atmosphere? Uh, 
That's a good question. Um, if um, uh, we look at lots of planets and don't see any oxygen, what does that tell us about life? Um, what are the odds that a planet that has oxygen in photosynthesis will evolve a 20% oxygen atmosphere like the Earth? These are all questions we don't really have answers to. And if we want to understand them, um, what we need to do is study the Earth's past, um, given that this is the only planet that we really, the only living planet that we really have to work with. So uh, this, is what, this is our natural laboratory. So the question that we're going to focus on here is why. Why is there this rise of oxygen uh, about 2.3 billion years ago uh, in Earth history? And we're not going to resolve that question, but we're going to point the way towards a resolution, hopefully. So the simplest answer to that question that you might uh, imagine is a, a biological explanation, an evolutionary explanation. If oxygenic photosynthesis is required uh, to uh, have large amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere, then perhaps at 2.3 billion years ago, or two point, just a bit before that, 2.4 billion years ago, perhaps then that is the time when Photosystem 2 evolves. And here's a picture of the oxygen evolving center of Photosystem 2. Um, and so perhaps this uh, biochemistry evolves at that point and rapidly proceeds to take over the world and make the planet an oxygenated, an oxygenated world. That is a view that you will certainly find in many textbooks. It's a view that is strongly espoused by researchers like Joe Kirschwink uh, uh, today, um, at least as of last week when I saw him at GSA. Um, so um, that, that's one hypothesis that you could advance, and it's, and it's a reasonable hypothesis. It's, in fact, a very difficult hypothesis to refute without going into the geologic record, as we're going to try to do. Um, most of the community, though, thinks it's probably not so simple. And the reason for that is as follows. I want to give you, get across for you a, at least a cartoon idea of why uh, it's probably not as simple as just oxygen photosynthesis evolves and uh, the planet becomes oxygenated. So we're going to start just by thinking very simply the way a geochemist does about oxygenic photosynthesis. What is it? So uh, if there are any biologists in the audience who will be horrified by this, but the way a geochemist thinks about oxygenic photosynthesis is that one takes CO2 and water and reacts them together and makes O2. And um, here, even if you're not a, a, a life scientist, this is just horrifying. If you're an organic geochemist, it's a horrifying thing to say that all organic carbon is CH2O. That's, of course, a gross simplification, but to, um, um, to a first approximation, if we're just thinking stoichiometrically of the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, this is the product of photosynthesis. O2 and, quote unquote, organic carbon uh, in the stoichiometry CH2O. So this is what photosynthesis is doing. Um, but there's also, of course, a back reaction, which is very fortunate. Um, it's what is allowing all of us to sit in our various rooms across the country and and watch this, this uh, uh, seminar, for better or worse, um, it's aerobic respiration, the back reaction of O2 with organic carbon to give you back CO2 and water. We're all, all of us sitting in the room, in, the ro in our rooms are doing this right now. Um, and this is a very efficient process such that almost all the oxygen that's produced per year in the biosphere is reconsumed by oxidation with organic carbon to give you back CO2 and water. So in a sense, this is, uh, although obviously this is important because it's producing lots of oxygen, this is, this is very rapidly all consumed. So it's not so simple on a geologic time scale, it's not so simple to just look at oxygen photosynthesis and say, aha, if we have it, then we have lots of oxygen in the atmosphere. To a, if, sorry, was there a question? To, to a geochemist, thinking uh, about this requires thinking outside this fast box a little bit. Uh, to a geochemist, what uh, needs to be considered is that um, on geologically relevant time scales, there's a slow leakage out of this loop in the form of organic carbon being buried in sediments. Uh, actually, most of the organic carbon that makes it uh, uh, to be buried in sediments also gets reoxidized by processes happening in sediments, but a small fraction of that actually gets buried, gets sequestered for geologically relevant periods of time um, uh, in, in uh, sediments, particularly in the deep ocean. Um, a consequence of this is that for every mole of organic carbon that one buries in sediments, there is a mole of oxygen left behind in the atmosphere. And to a, a geochemist thinking in long time scales, this is the geologically relevant source, quote unquote, of oxygen to the atmosphere. You need to have this going on in here. You need to have the oxygenic photosynthesis to produce the oxygen. But without some process like this bearing organic carbon, you're not going to have buildup of, of oxygen in the atmosphere um, over time scales that are relevant to us when we think in terms of hundreds of millions of years. Of course, the, this is all uh, a cycle, and so there is a back reaction of that 
oxygen with reduced gases from volcanoes, with dissolved reductance in seawater, with reduced compounds, iron 2 plus, and other materials in igneous rocks and, and sediments. When these, when these buried organic sediments um, uh, are exhumed, which in some cases they are, um, you have then the opportunity for those sediments to re-react with oxygen. But all these processes happen slowly. They're, they operate on geological timescales. But to, to a geoscientist then, the, the rise of oxygen and the controls on oxygen are in part about oxygenic photosynthesis, but they're just as much about the balance between this flux, which is really about this flux down here, versus the rate of consumption of oxygen by reductants that, that become exposed on geologically meaningful timescales. So it's this balance that becomes very important if you are a, uh, a geoscientist. And one way you can think about this, um, apologies for the typo up here, there shouldn't be a B up there, um, is you can sort of divide these two views into a supply side view and a demand side view. So the supply side view is that oxygenic photosynthesis evolves at 2.4 or 2.3 billion years ago and rapidly takes over the planet. The demand side view is that oxygenic photosynthesis um, has to evolve by that time, but may have evolved much, much earlier. And that oxygen takes over only when the oxic sources, the production of oxygen, the net production of oxygen, overwhelms the reducing sinks, um, which may be as much because of a change in the reflux of reductants um, as it may be because of a rise in oxygen uh, production. Um, so this is a more complicated picture, and in particular, from an evolutionary standpoint, this demand side picture uh, allows for the possibility that oxygenic photosynthesis is extremely ancient. It could, you know, hypothetically, it could date back to very shortly after the origin of life, um, which could be 3.8 billion years ago. Um, so these are very; these two views have very different consequences for how early oxygenic photosynthesis might exist. As I said before, it's very hard to differentiate between these hypotheses, but one of the simplest ways you can think of to differentiate between them is to search for evidence of oxygen in the record before 2.4 or 2.3 billion years ago, before the great rise of oxygen. If you find evidence of oxygen in that earlier record, then you have, if, if, at least if it's in amounts that are larger than what can easily be made by um, non-biological processes, then you have an argument um, for this demand side point of view. Now, of course, there have been many uh, studies over the years that uh, have provided data that people have interpreted in terms as indicating evidence of oxygen uh, in the during the first half of Earth history, at least in, in some amounts. Um, so the most classic uh, line of evidence that you'll find is the presence of banded iron formations in the Archean and Paleoproterozoic, but particularly here in the Archean geological record. So banded iron formations are these massive deposits of iron oxide. Um, another line of evidence that has become very much in vogue in the last decade or so are particular organic biomarkers. Um, that, for example, those biomarkers that are indicative of uh, the, or argued by many people, and I think agreed to by most, to be indicative of the presence of eukaryotes, which require oxygen for some of their biochemistry uh, in the early record. The trouble with these, and these are both fine lines of, of, of evidence, um, and I'm not trying to argue against any of them, is that they have, they have, they're controversial. So in the case of organic biomarkers, as I just said, while most of the community, I think, accepts the validity of the, of the data that's been produced to date, um, there is great concern, including by some of the authors of some of the most notable studies, about the possibility of contamination of ancient sediments um, from which some of these spectacular uh, molecules have been extracted. Um, so although this is, this is a, a great line of evidence, it's not without its, its criticisms and flaws, um, or at least challenges, and so you'd like to have other lines of evidence. Banded iron formations, similarly, uh, you can produce banded iron formations, of course, by taking iron 2 plus in the oceans and oxidizing it with O2 to make iron 3 plus, which precipitates out to make iron hydroxides. So they, you can take these as evidence of oxygen. But there are at least two other mechanisms which have not been uh, refuted, despite some efforts to do so, um, some experimental efforts to do so, um, which can alternatively produce massive deposits of iron oxide without having oxygen around. One of these methods is by photooxidation. So ultraviolet light can react with iron 2 plus to form iron 3 plus. Uh, and laboratory experiments show that that's rapid enough that it can account for at least some banded iron formations. Um, and more in vogue in recent years is the notion of anoxygenic photosynthesis. Photosynthesis by bacteria that, that instead of using water as an electron donor, use iron 2 plus as an electron donor. And such bacteria, instead of producing oxygen, produce iron 3 plus as the oxidized waste product. And such bacteria were, were a, a concept uh, uh, when I was first studying about this 20 years ago or so. Um, but in the last decade, they've been discovered to actually exist. And they oxidize iron at a rate fast enough um, to also account for banded iron formations. 
So although both these lines of evidence are, are quite reasonable, neither of them is incontrovertible, so you'd like to have additional lines of evidence to work with. And this is typically the case when you study uh, Earth history, that uh, you are in a deductive mode of reasoning, and you, ne you rarely find a smoking bullet, um, or a silver bullet, or a smoking gun, or a silver bullet that comes from a smoking gun, um, and you're left trying to accumulate lines of evidence um, and hope that if you find multiple lines of evidence that point in the same direction, that the cumulative weight of those lines, even though none is perfectly solid, is um, convincing to what one hopes is two sigma confidence. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the use of redox-sensitive transition metals as a tool to look at changes in oxygenation through time. And this is not a new idea. I learned about it uh, from a book that Dick Holland wrote in 1984, and um, I don't know that the idea even was uh, unique to Dick at that time. So this is an old idea, but it hasn't really been applied all that much, and not at the level of detail and systematic investigation that, that we've been able to do with this astrobiology drill core. Um, this figure is meant to get across the basic concept, though. So why, why, what elements are we focusing on? We're going to focus a lot on the element molybdenum. Um, which I don't pick just because it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, I also don't pick it because uh, uh, the joke I like to tell is that for those of you who are Douglas Adams fans, if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, you know that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. And uh, the atomic number of molybdenum is indeed 42. So it makes good sense to be obsessed with molybdenum for that reason. But that's actually not the reason we're focusing on it. The reason geochemically that molybdenum is a entertaining element to work with or a... Uh, uh, um, a good element to work with is because it has a very contrasting behavior as a function of environmental redox chemistry. It has a switch-like behavior, as has been uh, des described in the literature. So what you, this, this figure is meant to get this concept across. So what you're seeing here is a profile of molybdenum concentration in the Black Sea, which is the type locality on the modern planet that you go to if you want to look at strongly contrasting redox behavior. So the surface waters of the Black Sea are oxygenated. The deep waters of the Black Sea um, have very little oxygen and have, in fact, a, a large amount of hydrogen sulfide, very reducing environment. And molybdenum shows a very sharply contrasting behavior as a go you go across this transition, the so-called redox climb. So why is that? The reason for that is that in oxygenated waters, molybdenum is highly unreactive. It's present as the molybdate anion, um, which is a highly unreactive uh, uh, ion such that molybdenum has a very long residence time in the modern oceans, about 800,000 years. And in fact, it's the most abundant transition metal in the modern oceans because this molybdate ion is so unreactive. So even molybdenum is by far not an abundant element in the crust. It turns out to be the most abundant transition metal in the oceans because of its uh, great stability, uh, chemical stability, when, in the, when um, fully oxygenated. However, when molybdenum gets into a reducing environment, uh, the chemistry changes very sharply. Um, what happens is actually not a redox reaction to first order, but a substitution of sulfurs for oxygens around this molybdenum 6 plus uh, 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 center, and to form these guys, which are referred to as oxythiomolybdates. And these are very particle reactive and hence get scavenged out of the water column. And in uh, uh, ocean basins, the um, dominant form of particulate matter that's raining down for this stuff to stick onto are organic carbon particles, and hence you have an affinity of molybdenum for organic carbon in these kind of environments. So the molybdenum gets removed from the water, and it's getting removed by being scrubbed out onto organic carbon particles. Um, so the upshot is that molybdenum uh, is abundant in oxygenated seawater. It, it is not going to be so abundant in seawater if it's, that's not oxygenated. And as we'll talk about also, molybdenum will tend to accumulate in sedimentary environments that are full of hydrogen sulfide, um, the accumulated waters that are full of hydrogen sulfide. Those will tend to concentrate molybdenum. Um, in addition, molybdenum, rhenium is another element with very similar behavior, and to some degree, uranium, although as we'll talk about, uranium is not quite identical. So the concept underlying this application is, is then very simple. The idea here is that on a world where you have oxygen, if oxygen is present, then molybdenum can accumulate in the oceans. And it does so in, uh, through several steps that are oxygen sensitive. The first step is weathering of molybdenum carrying minerals on the continents, which are mostly sulfide minerals. So those are very reactive with oxygen. So molybdenum sulfides in igneous rocks will weather in the presence of oxygen, releasing their molybdenum to river waters. If there's a lot of oxygen around, then that molybdenum becomes molybdate and is highly soluble and unreactive, and it gets delivered to the oceans where it can accumulate. And that can happen on land. It can also happen uh, uh, in a submarine setting where you have submarine basalts, where, again, you have sulfides that contain molybdenum and rhenium. Um, and the chemistry of those is going to be sensitive to oxygen. It will, they will release their molybdenum into, this, into the water in the presence of oxygen. 
On the other hand, if oxygen is absent, then you have a very different story. Then this flux is turned off, essentially, because the weathering rates of the sulfide minerals carrying these elements on land are very, going to be very slow, um, and the, um, the, the minerals will be much more robust against weathering. The solubility of molybdenum will be lower in, in the waters. It won't be able to accumulate in the oceans as much, and so you'll have a world with much less molybdenum in the oceans. So the, the, the amount of molybdenum and rhenium, and to some degree uranium in the oceans in these two scenarios is going to be quite different. And where you would go to look for that, um, let me skip this slide, um, is in anoxic environments, like the sediments beneath the modern Black Sea. Um, those are the places where um, molybdenum is going to get, is going to accumulate from seawater if there is molybdenum in the seawater to, uh, to accumulate. So if you go to the modern Black Sea, you'll find there's a good amount of molybdenum in the sediments beneath that basin, uh, because although this is an anoxic basin, it's in contact with a very large oxygenated ocean, which is chock full of molybdenum. If such a basin, however, formed in the Archean, um, and if in the Archean there was very little oxygen in the, envir in the environment, you would expect there to be very little molybdenum in the oceans of that time, and the sediments accumulating in such a basin in the Archean would probably be relatively low in molybdenum. That's the basic concept here. And in fact, if we go to a number of modern basins, what you're seeing here is the molybdenum concentration versus a parameter called TOC, which is just uh, an abbreviation to confuse you. This is total organic carbon. Remember I said there should be an affinity between molybdenum and organic carbon in sediments. And so you can go to a number of modern basins. Here's the Black Sea, the Frembarn Fjord, Karyako Basin, the Sonic Inlet. These are, these are very well studied modern anoxic basins. And you can see that they all, each one of them shows this trend. It's, each one has a different slope, but each one shows a trend of molybdenum versus organic carbon. And the amount of molybdenum in these sediments, and these are in the sediments underneath these, the waters in these basins, and the amount of molybdenum in these sediments is very high compared to average crustal abundances. So molybdenum in the average crust is around a part per million by weight, um, and the sediments in these kind of basins, you're talking about tens to even hundreds of parts per million of molybdenum. And the reason for that, again, just to stress this, is that these kind of environments, these anoxic environments, are environments in which molybdenum that is abundant in seawater, um, uh, there are environments in which molybdenum, which is abundant in seawater, becomes destabilized and gets scrubbed out into sediment. So these are the kind of places you go to look for evidence that you had oceans with lots of molybdenum in them. So today we have an ocean with lots of molybdenum, and sediments in these environments are then very rich in molybdenum. Um, now you can go back, so these kind of sediments then, if you, if you let them uh, get buried and altered through time, turn into the kind of rocks that we refer to as black shales. And if you look at black shales uh, in the geologic past, for example in the Devonian, where these have been very well studied, and look at the trend of molybdenum versus organic carbon in Devonian black shales, you find that that, uh, that trend is very similar to the range of, of um, values that you find in these modern sediments. So. Um, this is telling us, first of all, that the Devonian, the bulk oceans, probably had a lot of molybdenum, and hence there was probably a fair amount of oxygen around, even though there are lots of black shales from that time. Um, but the other thing, it's the, the main point I want to drive home is that we see in modern sedimentary systems this relationship between molybdenum and organic carbon and these molybdenum enrichments, and we see these also in Devonian um, black shales. So we can go back, to, back in time to rocks that are hundreds of millions of, year, uh, millions of years old and see something very similar to what we find in modern basins. And that gives us confidence that we are, are kind of on to what's going on here, that, that we have a handle on it. Ariel, would you just say how long ago the Devonian was? Uh, it's a few, well, I'm not sure exactly these, these samples. It's uh, about um, on the order of 300 million years ago. So um, to assess this a little bit, um, so it's nowhere near as old as what we're go where we're going, but it's a period of time has been very well studied with respect to the chemistry of uh, black shales. So it's um, sort of the ancient analog of the modern Black Sea, which has been very well studied for the chemistry of these redox sensitive metals. So um, we've actually used this sort of tool in a in a in a gross sense already. Um, in studies shown here, this is a, a paper by. Um, Clint Scott, who's a student of Tim Lines at UC Riverside, who's been compiling data both from the literature and uh, published, already previously published data, on molybdenum in black shales through time. Um, and there are complexities here that I, I don't want to go into, but the basic concept here is that um, if you look at molybdenum in black shales through time, you indeed see a uh, uh, sort of secular changes. In the Archean, you generally see very low concentrations of molybdenum. Um, uh, you know, 1 to 10 ppm sort of values are, are typical. Then you go into the Proterozoic and you see higher, you see some molybdenum enrichments, 
but they're nowhere near as spectacular as what you see in the Phanerozoic, in the more modern record. So if you recall that cartoon I showed you, the three stages of oxygen evolution, um, and that figure the axis ran the other way, my apologies if these axes flip around, and that figure back in time was there and the modern was over here, and this figure we, we flipped it the other way, here's the Archean and here's the modern. But you can see that as in that cartoon, there's a three sort of a suggestion of a three-stage story here, which is what you would expect, that if oxygen really went from very low to intermediate to high, then molybdenum in sediments would go from very low to intermediate to high. And indeed, we see something like that with, with some complexities that we're not going to discuss in this talk here. But this sort of, the fact that we can see this sort of thing in the ancient record gives us good confidence that, in, again, that indeed we are onto something when it comes to using molybdenum in sediments through time as a proxy for oxygen in the environment. As we're going to talk about uh, in, in, uh, in a couple of minutes with the, the data that we're showing, that we're obtaining now, we're finding evidence of short-lived variations um, in molybdenum, uh, possibly short-lived variations of molybdenum, even in the Archean, um, which is the big story here, as we'll, as we'll get to. So if you want to study this sort of thing, you need to find the right kind of sediments. We've said you want these bla so-called black shales. These sediments are black because they're full of organic carbon. And here's a nice picture of one of the uh, drill core samples that we've worked on. This is the kind of thing that you want. Nice, as we say in the business, juicy black shales. Also, they contain these beautiful pyrite uh, nodules and laminations. These are iron sulfides um, that form in reduced environments. This is what you want, uh, this kind of material. The reason that drilling becomes very important, uh, that, and the reason that something like the astrobiology drilling program has been so critical, is because what you find at the surface is very typically altered. It's usually not quite as bad as this picture, but this is, is a fun picture to show the extreme of what can happen. So in Western Australia, where you have rocks of the appropriate antiquity and of the appropriate very low grade of metamorphism, which is critical for this kind of work, um, you unfortunately also have pervasive oxidative weathering of the surface environment. Water over time flows through rocks. Um, if that water has oxygen in it, um, then you start to oxidize whatever's in the rocks. So what you're seeing here is a picture of what, uh, in, in a drill core, is a nice black shale, but an outcrop, where it's been exposed for we don't know how long, um, uh, in outcrop, it's weathered to pieces. Uh, the, it's not black at all, it's white, because the organic carbon has essentially been oxidized, it's been ashed, effectively, chemically, slowly. Um, but it's analogous to what would happen if you stuck that sample in, in a furnace and burned all the organic carbon. It's just been a very slow burn. So naturally, this kind of rock is not all that useful for the sort of thing that we're after, uh, because the redox-sensitive metals, like molybdenum, that were in here will no longer be in their primary um, uh, abundances. So drilling becomes very important. So the astrobiology drilling program, as I said, drilled 10 drill cores of various depths at various periods of time in Western Australia in 2003 and 2004. This is a picture here of Roger Buick, who was the mastermind behind this Hammersley Basin drill core. Um, he's pointing both to Western Australia, which is where the um, Hammersley Basin and the, the Pilbara Craton is, and to our drill core. So this particular core, this is number nine uh, of the 10 cores and was drilled in this location here. Now this project in some ways was rather star-crossed initially. Um, first of all, it took a quite a long time for it to evolve. It evolved initially as an outgrowth of the uh, Early Earth Focus Group, which was created when Barry Blumberg, uh, the uh, former director of the NAI, um, asked for the NAI teams to propose ideas for astrobiology missions. And he had in mind, of course, space missions, but a few of us got together and proposed the idea of a mission to the Early Earth. And so was born the focus group, and so eventually was born this particular project. Um, and as you can see, there was a long gestation, and finally we began to be able to analyze things in 2006. But as I said, this project was somewhat star-crossed, um, and I'll explain why, because it's kind of an amusing story of how science really works. Um, so here's the stratigraphy that we were pursuing. We were going after the last 250 million years of the Archean. Um, and in particular, the big focus was to study these sediments down here, these very old black shales that date back to around 2.7 billion years ago, which are of particular interest because these are the sediments from which um, biomarker evidence, um, which constitutes the earliest evidence of eukaryotes, uh, comes from. So these are very important rocks, and there's great desire to sample them again. And the, need, the reason to that they need to be sampled again is because the biomarker evidence that, ha what has been, uh, that was produced um, in a landmark paper in 1999 by Jochen Brox and Roger Summons and Roger Buick 
Um, those samples had been um, uh, had not been obtained in a pristine manner with respect to contamination, had not been stored in a manner to avoid contamination, and so there's been controversy uh, ever since those results were, were first uh, announced as to whether or not the biomarkers extracted from those rocks were really indigenous to the rocks. Um, great care was taken to try to confirm that that was indeed the case, but there remains lingering controversy about it. So there was great desire to, to resample those rocks, to sample them fresh, and to drill in a way that would be free of contamination. So that was the primary goal of this project, to go after those biomarkers and to also look at the environment at that time, and along the way to also look at the environment and biomarkers throughout this last 250 million years of the Archean leading, leading up to the rise of oxygen, the great oxidation event. As it turns out, we had two major problems. Um, the first problem is that uh, in the end, the, the drillers on this project insisted on using a hydrocarbon-based drilling fluid despite our protestations. Um, the fluid that they chose to use was something that should have been fairly molecularly well characterized so that we could uh, cope with it, but it turns out to be a much messier material than had been hoped. Um, Roger Summons is still uh, fairly optimistic that he'll be able to pull biomarker data out of here, but it's much proving to be much harder and more complicated than expected. So that was problem number one. Problem number two is that um, uh, we didn't actually get down to this stratigraphy in the end because the location where we were forced to drill was turned out not to be the ideal location. And I say forced because um, you don't have free reign to drill wherever you want to in the Pilbara. Um, uh, the Aboriginal groups have their claims over this land and you have to negotiate with them to find the, a place that is uh, uh, where they're, they will permit you to drill. And so the ideal location for this drilling turned out not to be the ideal location from their perspective. Um, and we were hopeful that the location that we finally settled on would work, but as it turns out, what happened is that in that location, this unit here, the Witt Noom formation, was stratigraphically thickened by about a factor of two. And so that although we drilled about a kilometer, we never actually got through this stratigraphy here. So our initial take on this project was, oh my God, what a what a colossal um, failure. Um, and we decided to to uh, to for forge ahead nonetheless. And our, our notion was to focus all our attention on this last period of time, on this unit here called the Mount McRae Shale, um, uh, and to look in the, at the environment and biology at that time. So that's what we're going to do here as I walk you through the data. So this Mount McRae Shale is a classic Archean black shale. It's perhaps the last black shale of the Archean. Um, and uh, it's been known for years and studied in various ways for years, but never with the detail we're going to go into here. And so here in, is, in detail is, is the piece of the core that we're looking at here. It's about 100 meters worth of drill core. And when you look at it in detail, it's not all black shale. There are actually two black shale units within here, the so-called S1 unit and S2 unit. And we further subdivide the S1 unit into two subunits. We'll mention, talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we decided to focus a lot of attention on these black shale units to see what we could learn, in particular with respect to paleoredox. Um, so I apologize, the masking here doesn't seem to have translated to WebEx all that perfectly, but hopefully this will come out okay. Um, so what you're seeing here is that drill core, the depths and the, the lithologies, the kind of rocks. And here you're see, going to see the you're going to see the molybdenum concentration in parts per million, and then here and here the molybdenum enrichment factor, which is essentially a way of comparing the molybdenum and, and here the rhenium concentrations in the sediment. Um, to those in the average continental crust. So a value of one is the same as average continental crust, and an enhancement from that is a deviation away from uh, above average crust. So when we look at the lower part here, this S2 unit, what do we find? In S2, we find very low values of molybdenum, very low molybdenum enrichment factors, and very low rhenium enrichment factors. Um, it looks very much like these black shales, although, as we'll see, they have a good amount of organic carbon, um, enough that in uh, the Phanerozoic, if you found such rocks, you'd find them spectacularly enriched in molybdenum. Um, in this case, they're not at all enriched in molybdenum. Um, and the simplest interpretation of this, as, as we'll come back to again, is that the oceans in which these sediments accumulated probably had relatively little organic, uh, probably had relatively little molybdenum dissolved in them. As we move up, though, into the upper part of the unit, we see the beginning of an enrichment in molybdenum concentrations and enrichment factors and rhenium enrichment factors as well getting up to molybdenum concentrations of around 40 parts per million. That's a, uh, a respectable amount of molybdenum. It's, it's lower than um, uh, equivalent black shale that you might find in the younger record, um, but it is uh, still quite, uh, um, uh, it's quite unusual for the Archean. Um, what we see here is more typical of what's been seen in Archean black shales. This is really quite unusual. 
And as we go further up, we see that these concentrations die away, the enrichment factors die away, but they never quite get back to the original values. Right? You have to look at it in some detail, but the enrichment factors here are all substantially higher than one, whereas down here they're barely higher than one, if at all. Um, so there's some change in the system when you compare the region down below to the region up above. Now, before we get too excited, we might want to ask ourselves, how do we know that what we're seeing here in terms of variations is actually primary? How do we know it's indigenous to the rocks? Um, of course, as I mentioned before, fluids pass through rocks. These, these rocks have had around uh, two and a half billion years to, um, to uh, be altered. Um, and so how do you know this molybdenum enrichment is not the result of metals coming in much later after deposition? And the way we go after that is by looking at uh, the rhenium-osmium geochronological system. Um, and the idea here is that this is a geochronometer. The rhenium-187 decays to osmium-187 with a half-life of around 42 billion years. So what we can do is we can take these sediments, particularly the ones that are rich in rhenium, and we can uh, see if they fall along a nice isochron. We can see if we get a, a, a geologically meaningful age. And the idea here is that if we come up with a nice isochron and a good age, we've, got, we've done two things. One is that we've got a, a better constraint on the age of these rocks than we had before, which is valuable, as we'll see. Um, and in addition, um, it provides a test for alteration. Because if you get a nice isochron and a geologically meaningful age, um, then, and by geologically meaningful, I mean an age that's consistent with what we think the age of this rock is a priori from other constraints, um, then it's likely that the rhenium enrichment that we're seeing here is indeed primary. If, on the other hand, that rhenium came in, you know, uh, uh, hundred, hundreds of millions of years later when this uh, region was subject to some alteration or another, then you would expect to get a very unreasonable age if, if you get a, re uh, a nice isochron at all. So this is a great um, test uh, of the primacy of this signal. And this work was done by Brian Kendall and Rob Prieser at University of Alberta. Brian was actually a visiting student at ASU learning how to work with molybdenum isotopes when we were studying these rocks and he asked if he could take some samples back to durinium osmium on because that's what he'd been doing for the bulk of his PhD thesis. And this is the data that he produced, which um, none of us suspected we could get something so nice. So here you're seeing the osmium isotopes versus rhenium osmium. This is a classic uh, 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 way of plotting a, a geochronologic data. And you're seeing, and here you see the various data points. They form an array because we sample, what Brian did is he sampled um, uh, at different distances along the core in order to get an array of parent to daughter ratios, which is essential for building an isochron this way. So these numbers correspond to different depths in the core. Um, across about uh, uh, 15 meters or so of, of depth, um, which, which spans that rhenium enrichment interval. And what you see is they fall along a very nice array. They define a very tight isochron corresponding to an age of uh, 2501 million years plus or minus 8.2. Very, very nice and tight isochron. Um, and this falls very nicely within the other constraints that exist for the age of this section. We knew it was around two and a half billion years ago. We knew it was before the gr Great Oxidation event, and now we know quite clearly it's, it's almost smack dab at the Archean Proterozoic boundary as it's commonly defined at 2.5 billion years ago. Um, so this is a spectacular confirmation both of the age of this, of this sequence of rocks and of the fact that, um, or the extreme likelihood, um, that the uh, metal variations we're seeing here are primary to the rock. They're not some sort of alteration product. Now, to get a little more sophisticated in how we interpret the data, um, if you recall before, we looked at a bunch of modern sedimentary environments. I plotted molybdenum concentration versus organic carbon content in sediments. So we can do the same here. And the reason to do this is because the absolute molybdenum concentration may vary as a function of the organic carbon content in the rock. So just looking at the molybdenum concentration alone is, is only seeing part of the story, and you could be fooled. Um, looking at these trends is, is a bit more solid. So here's molybdenum versus total organic carbon. Um, this is the field defined by the modern anoxic basins and also this Devonian trend, these uh, 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 Paleozoic black shales. And what you see here, here's the data from this S2 unit, the lower unit, the unit that has very little molybdenum. And it, it has actually, although it's much less organic carbon than the upper unit, so the axis, we're down here around values of five. This is actually a quite high amount of organic carbon for a, for a sedimentary rock. This is a black shale. And in the younger record, if you saw a rock with 5% organic carbon, you'd have molybdenum concentrations that are way up here. Um, however, that's not what we have in this S2 unit. We have a very shallow slope here. In other words, even as the organic carbon content was varying around from, from uh, 2 to 2% 2 to 6 or 7%, the molybdenum concentration was staying very low. 
And this says to us that, that, that during this period of time, these sediment, the water column that these sediments accumulated in looked very different from the water column of younger sediments, younger analogous sediments, in the sense of having much less molybdenum content in the water column. As you go into the S1 unit, as I mentioned, we subdivided and we split it in half, and each half has a slightly different trend, but each half has a quite respectable trend considering the antiquity of these rocks. Um, the correlation coefficients are quite reasonable. Um, and you can see that these trends actually approach those of modern uh, anoxic basins. They're lower, um, but they, are, they do approach them. So what we're seeing here, it looks like, is a transition from a world in which the oceans had very little molybdenum to a world in which uh, this, it's very hard to explain these data unless the water column in which these sediments accumulated had an uh, appreciable amount of molybdenum dissolved in it. That's the only way you can get these relationships as far as we understand right now. So it looks like we have a transition from one world to another world as we go from this array to either of these arrays. There may be a slight change between these two, um, and we could discuss that a bit. I don't, wouldn't want to pin too much on that, um, but clearly this world was different from this world with respect to the molybdenum content of the oceans. And arguably, it's certainly a reasonable interpretation to say that that change in molybdenum concentrations reflects a change in the oxidation state of the environment, which could be, well be due to change the amount of oxygen in the environment. We can argue nuances of that, but that's a, certainly a reasonable story. And so the notion would be that we, we have captured here at 2.5 billion years ago a transition from a situation in which the oceans were very low in molybdenum because the environment was very low in oxygen to a world in which there was perhaps more oxygen available. Now, I should stress that I've presented this all so far in terms of a world, and we really don't know that. We're looking at one location at one period of time. It's quite possible that what we're seeing is a very local phenomenon. You could imagine a, 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 a small basin or a large basin, but a, something isolated from the global ocean where you have a bloom of cyanobacteria and injection of oxygen into the water column in that region, uh, causing perhaps not even a change in the atmospheric oxygen, but just a change in the oxidation state of the waters, resulting in weathering of submarine sulfide, the accumulation of molybdenum in the water column, and hence a transition from this kind of situation to this kind of situation just locally. So this could be purely a local story, and it could be purely a submarine oxygenation story, or it could be a global story involving some small amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere um, on, a, on a much larger scale. We can't tell from this data alone. Um, either way, the significance is more or less well, the significance is different, but it's significant either way, um, because in either case, uh, we have a reasonable story of um, uh, reasonable evidence of there being oxygen present in the environment, even if only locally, um, 2.5 billion years ago, which is 100 million years or so before uh, the Great Oxidation event really takes off. Now, you might ask, how much oxygen are we talking about? How much do we need to do this? And there, are, there that's, a, that's a very hard thing to get a handle on, um, but we go, we've gone about it in this way. Um, this, it's the simplest thing, about the only thing that we can do easily right now. We can ask ourselves if, if molybdenum and rhenium are carried in sulfide minerals, um, like, like iron pyrite here, um, we can ask ourselves how much oxygen do we need to start to change the weathering behavior of these minerals? How much oxygen um, do we need to start liberating lots of molybdenum and rhenium from igneous rocks if the molybdenum and rhenium are present in the form of... Uh, molybdenum and rhenium sulfides or molybdenum and rhenium associated with pyrite or other um, sulfide minerals. And this is fool's gold, so I suppose we should be careful that we aren't on a fool's errand in doing this, but it's something we can at least try to do to get a handle on how much oxygen. It turns out there are very few studies of uh, the rate of weathering of sulfides as a function of the amount of oxygen, but there is one study from the uh, early 1990s by Williamson and Rinstead that looks pretty good, that other workers in the field have also made use of. Um, so they looked at the weathering rate of pyrite as a function of oxygen, and from, from the, the function that they derived, you can make a plot like this, which is, which is answering the following question. Let's imagine that I have a pyrite nodule, that's a, or pyrite uh, grain, that's about 100 microns in size, a pyrite cube. That's sort of a typical size you might find in an igneous rock. And let's ask, how long, in years, will that pyrite grain last um, when exposed to oxygen to oxygenated waters where the oxygen in the atmosphere is at these different partial pressures. And what you do if you, use, if you look at their paper and use their function is you obtain a line like this. And the message here is that even with very low amounts of oxygen, 10 to the minus 5 or even 10 to the minus 6 of the present atmospheric level, um, that pyrite grain is going to fall apart, is going to dissolve to nothing within 10 to 100,000 years. 
which geologically speaking in a weathering context is fairly fast, fairly fast. So the idea here is that you don't need very much oxygen to cause pyrite grains of this size to weather very rapidly, much more rapidly than they did before. And so this is why we suspect um, that the amount of oxygen that we need to explain this is actually very small. That's why we talk about this in terms of a whiff of oxygen. We're not talking about a 2.5 billion years a shift to an oxygenated planet. We're not talking about a percent of the modern oxygen level, let alone something uh, close to the modern oxygen level. We're talking about something very small, um, but um, but more than what was there before, because before this this excursion to metal concentration, it looks like there was little or no uh, uh, even even less oxygen around, if we can infer from this molybdenum proxy. And a little bit of strengthening of this idea comes from looking at the uranium as well as the rhenium and molybdenum. So I've mentioned uranium several times as we've gone along here. I've said it's similar to molybdenum and rhenium, but I've always hedged that and said it's a little different. And, and um, as you can see here, when we actually look at the uranium through this drill core um, at high resolution, um, we don't see anything like the feature that we see in molybdenum and rhenium abundances. Somehow the uranium is behaving differently. And we're, we, we think, we hypothesize anyway, that the story here has to do with the fact that the oxygen level is very low and the fact that uranium, rhenium, and molybdenum actually have some differences in their chemistry when oxygen is very low. One of the primary differences is the carrier mineral of these metals in igneous rocks. So as I've said, molybdenum and rhenium are found in sulfide minerals, um, which are very susceptible to oxidative weathering. Uranium, though, in igneous rocks is primarily found in feldspars and zircons and various minerals that are not nearly as susceptible to oxygen. So if you imagine a world where there's very little oxygen around, essentially anoxic, um, and then you introduce a whiff of oxygen, um, quote unquote, 10 to the minus 5 of, of the modern level, something like that, you will start to oxidize sulfides. You will significantly perturb the molybdenum and rhenium budgets of the ocean, but you won't significantly perturb the uranium budget of the ocean, um, either locally or globally. And that's one of the ways that uranium is different from molybdenum and rhenium. There are other ways that also factor in in the same way. Um, that all point in the direction of, of arguing that we have evidence of a small amount of oxygen, enough to perturb these elements' budgets, but not enough to perturb the uranium budget. And somewhere in here, if we could get more quantitative about these various weathering rates of minerals, we could probably actually put a much tighter constraint than what I've done so far on the amount of oxygen that might have been around. And I'd be remiss if I didn't stress that what's it, the message from the companion paper, Kaufman et al., uh, as I mentioned, there's two papers published in Science at the end of September. One focuses on the metals, that's what I've dwelled on here. The other paper focuses on mass-independent sulfur isotopes, which are a, 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 an hour-plus lecture unto themselves, so I can't do this justice. Um, but for those who are familiar with this, I want to point out that the sulfur isotopes also show um, uh, distinct changes that couple very nicely to the, what we're seeing with the metals. So here is plotted this uh, two parameters, the cap delta-33 sulfur versus the uh, delta-34 sulfur. Again, I'm not going to explain this because it would take an hour to do so. But notice that, there, that, the, that down here, the data fall along a well-defined array here. And this is in the lower unit, this lower black shale unit. Um, the data fall along this, this well-defined array. But when you go up to the upper black shale unit, suddenly that, 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 um, the data uh, array changes markedly. The array you see down here is typical of what's seen in Archean uh, sediments. This is very unusual. And the simplest explanation, if you follow through all the, the details of logic, um, the simplest explanation for this transition is that there is a turn on from here to here of an oxidative part of the sulfur cycle, that we start to oxidize, um, reduce sulfur compounds in the surface ocean um, to make um, sulfate, which can then again be re-reduced in a reducing basin to give us this particular isotopic signal. It's a slightly complicated story, um, but uh, and so I'm not, I can't possibly go into it here. But suffice to say, there's a big change here, and this, the, the most straightforward interpretation, although it is not a simple interpretation um, in and of itself, is that this is consistent with this change in oxidation state in the environment. Um, you can also plot the capital delta 36 against capital delta 33. These are two mass independent signatures plotted against each other. And you see that in the lower unit, the data fall along this array here. In the upper unit, they fall along this array with a somewhat different slope. And this is indicative of some sort of change in the atmospheric chemistry of sulfur that we don't fully understand. Um, but it is, it is certainly suggestive, it, well, it's indicative of some sort of change in, in atmospheric chemistry, um, which may well uh, couple with the notion of there being a little bit of oxygen around changing the, the speciation of, of gases in the atmosphere. The final thing to take away from this figure 
is the, the axes over here. So, so over here, we're looking at the lower and upper unit in the Mount McRae Shale, this Western Australian black shale. Um, but the data that I've shown you here are actually a compilation that includes data from our drill core, as well as data from a drill core from South Africa. Uh, the, um, uh, and um, uh, what you see is that the two data sets on both these basins, both, um, both the South African basin and the Western Australian basin, show the same sort of trends. And that is at least suggestive of um, the effects that we're seeing not being simply in one small isolated basin, but perhaps being global. Now, there's debate about this because it's not entirely clear that these two basins, one in Western Australia, one in South Africa, were actually uh, very far apart two and a half billion years ago. They may have been part of one large basin at that time, um, but it's what you got to work with, so it's, it's, where it's, it's what you look at. And it's at least suggested that there could have been a more widespread effect than, uh, than you might otherwise think. So to take us back to our initial motivation, here's our cartoon of oxygen in the environment through time. Um, uh, the sort of canonical story that, that most people will uh, 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 recite to you who are, who are knowledgeable about the field. And what we think we find here is that, so here's the, the great oxidation event um, starting around 2.4 and really taking off around 2.3. Um, what we think is that we have evidence now of uh, a whiff of oxygen at 2.5 billion years ago here at this point in time. And you put this together with the biomarker evidence and the BIFs, um, uh, and you start to start to uh, have increased confidence in the notion that oxygen may well have been present in the environment uh, well before the great oxidation event. And we think we've also here developed an, a, a novel strategy for going about looking for evidence of that oxygen. We very much like to look at other sediments of greater antiquity and see how far back this particular signature might go. And the final thought I want to leave you with is that as we think more and more and get, uh, get better data, and data as we have now at high temporal resolution, looking at high resolution in the drill core through time um, in the Archean, I think we probably need to start to shift our vision of, um, of, of what the debate is of all about when we talk about oxygen in the, ancient envi in the Archean environment. Um, the debate is often depicted in a cartoon fashion between those who argue for an anoxic world and those who argue for an oxygenated world. Um, if you read the papers carefully, even between partisans in that debate, you see that it's actually not so simple, that, that anoxic never really means no oxygen or rarely means no oxygen. It can mean, but not necessarily. Um, and those who argue for an oxygenated environment often are talking about something that is a percent of the modern or maybe even a bit less as oxygenated. But, but, but that's in detail. If you step back, the argument often is, is between those who say lots of oxygen and those who say none. And I think in the Archean, we need to have a somewhat more sophisticated view of things. And, and I'm trying to embody that here in this figure here. So this is a, a picture not of the Archean. This is of the modern, or the recent, um, from zero to 650,000 years ago. You're looking here at data of carbon dioxide and methane in Antarctic ice cores. Right? So we know very well from the modern that these gases are trace gases in the modern environment, um, present in parts per million and parts per billion concentrations in the, atm in the atmosphere. Um, and they're variable. Right Now, you wouldn't say that the modern atmosphere is amethanic, um, but the amount of methane is indeed very low. But it's, there's enough there that we actually worry about it quite a bit. And you wouldn't say that the modern atmosphere is devoid of carbon dioxide, even though it's present as a fairly trace constituent. Um, it's, even though it's trace, it's still significant in its impact on the environment. And I think that oxygen in the Archean is probably somewhat of the same thing. I, I think we, we, we need to open our minds to the possibility anyway that oxygenic photosynthesis might be quite ancient, um, that oxygen, that other factors beyond the evolution of oxygen photo, oxygenic photosynthesis kept oxygen low for a billion years or more, um, and that during that time, oxygen behaved in the atmosphere very much as methane and CO2 do now. That it was present in low amounts and variable amounts, amounts that may have been very highly variable geographically, um, but it was there. And some of the debates we have between various proxies may not be nearly as black and white as we like to think, it may well be that the amount of oxygen bounces around um, uh, too low to trip one proxy, but high enough to trip another, and then back and forth and back and forth. And I suspect that as we dig deeper and deeper into the Archean record, we'll emerge with a picture somewhat like this, of oxygen as a biogenic trace gas bouncing around um, uh, various values, always low, but, but, off, uh, but uh, often present. And uh, I'll leave you with just this set of conclusions. I won't walk through them. Um, other than to say that we have in progress a number of other studies that I haven't gone into here because there's simply no time. We're looking at iron isotope data. We're looking at molybdenum and other isotopes. I want to stress in particular, I should have mentioned this at the outset, that almost all the metal data you've seen here have been generated by um, my 
PhD student Yun Duan and uh, co-workers here at ASU, uh, Gail Arnold, uh, no longer at ASU, but rec until recently at ASU, and Gwyneth Gordon. And Yun is also working as part of her thesis on iron isotopes and molybdenum isotopes, which show variations that I'm not comfortable sharing in a very public forum like this yet, but show variations that are quite uh, sympathetic with the story that I've been uh, outlining for you up to this point. So we're looking at other proxies. We're starting to look at other locations in more detail, look at that South African basin in more detail for metal content. And uh, the story, so the story that you've heard today, I think is just the first of a richer story to come. So thanks, I'll be glad to take any questions. Okay, Ariel, thank you very much for a great talk and a very clear one. Uh, would anybody around the net who has questions, please raise your hand on WebEx. And while you're doing that, there's a question here at NAI Central from David Morrison. Hi, David. Hi, Ariel. Thanks very now much. Um, I sure, now I can tell who that is in that little picture there. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious about this, the period of time between 2.5 and 2.3 or so. You talked about why you couldn't go lower in this drill core, but is there data from the drill core to indicate whether this whiff stays around, goes up and down, or whatever in the subsequent uh, 200 million years? Sure, sure. Well, this drill core, we can't really go much, much younger. Um, uh, we're basically looking at the upper part that we can that we can work on. It it was it that's just the nature of this core. The, there is a South African drill core project um, uh, the, funded by a private foundation, the Agron Foundation, which actually more or less starts where this core leaves off and works its way up in time. And that's what we're eager to dig into in part. Um, the story gets a bit more complicated because that South African core is is from uh, a different facies. The the sediments there were laid down in shallower water. And so whether those are the right, whether they provide the right kind of environment for sequestering molybdenum in the same way, so whether you're, we could be comparing apples and apples and apples and oranges is not clear, but that's, that's one of the directions we're going in. Um, within this core, though, I mean, it is, you know, we've we looked, well, let me find the right figure here. And yeah, this is the one I want. So as I, as I, I tried to stress, but it's worth um, stressing again. So, so you look at these data and you see this, this, this excursion, and um, it's very tempting, especially when we use a word like whiff, to imagine that this is a transient phenomenon. And I even, I even said that at the outset, that it might be transient. And, and it, it might be somewhat transient, but it, if you look at this in detail, um, I tried to stress it before, I'm going to stress it again. The molybdenum enrichment factors here are very, very low. Up here, uh, throughout up here, they're not so low. They're not as high as they are here, but they're not so low. It looks like there was molybdenum in the environment, in the aqueous environment here, more so than there was down here. So, and, and if you look at the molybdenum um, to organic carbon ratio here, um, as, as I mentioned, I don't want to make too much of it, but um, you go from this unit at the very bottom to this here. This is the lower part of the upper unit where the big excursion happens. And then as you go up, you've, you settle down into this slope here, which is a little shallower, but it's still much steeper than what's down here. So this is a more sophisticated way of saying the same thing, that what comes after that excursion is still different than what came before. And, and what we say in the paper is that this may well have been, we, we may well be seeing an irreversible transition of some sort here. Um, uh, so, you know, bets are off, but, but it's quite possible that that's what, what we're seeing here. Does that, does that address the question? Yeah, that's great, but it still tells me you need more data in those oh. uh, couple of hundred million years before this. We need more rocks. We need more drilling. And Penn State has a question. Yeah, hi, hi, Ariel. This is Jim Casting. I, hi, I Jim. like your story. Like your story a lot, and uh, I'm just wondering about the implications when you talk about a whiff of oxygen there. You compared oxygen in the uh, reduced Archean atmosphere to methane in the ox in the present oxygenic atmosphere. It's it's a good analogy in some way, I think. But on the other hand, there's a significant difference, and that's that today you've got oxygen and ozone, so a good UV screen. Back then, if you didn't, the, then the photolysis rates are much faster, and so the lifetime of oxygen in a methane-rich atmosphere is much shorter than the lifetime of methane in an oxygen-rich atmosphere. So I guess the difference in my mind is that it's hard to have a very low lev level of oxygen, like one one ppm or something like that, that's, that's a global signal. It'll just be a plume. And I, I think your whiff may actually be bigger than you think. <laughs> 
Uh, could be, or I mean, I mean, much of the, unless I'm wrong, much of the logic you just presented is in a sort of steady state sense, and it, you've mentioned plumes at the end, so you could imagine that you have a world where you have plumes and wafts of oxygen that aren't very long lived, but they do get around, not globally perhaps, but in a regional sense, and maybe that's what we're seeing. I, I don't know. I mean, like like all analogies, um, you know, it's poetry and it's imperfect, and I leave it to to those who think more deeply about the atmospheric physics and chemistry to really dig into it, but. Uh, but, but the major well, we point about, I, I we okay. talked about this in our seminar here last week, and and uh, you know the question is what do you need to weather molybdenum, molybdenum which I can't say properly, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, maybe you maybe you do need a global signal, in which case maybe it's a pretty big puff of oxygen. Maybe maybe what we really need is is uh, well we need more drilling as David alluded to, but we also uh, we need more experimental work. You know, the, the amount of experimental work that goes on that actually tries to tie to Archean and Proterozoic geochemistry is very small. And that's, you know, it would be nice to to revisit the kind of thing that Williamson and Rimstedt did with, with pyrite, um, but with uh, with more sulfides and and perhaps with newer techniques. Uh, agree. Ariel, I've got a question that's a little far afield, and I'd encourage other people to raise their hands on WebEx uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, and that is that there has been work, particularly by Dave Demaray's group, uh, including Dave and Tori Holer and Brad Bebout, about the role that the production of reduced gases may have played somewhat counterintuitively in oxidizing Earth's atmosphere in that these microbial communities that exist today and presumably existed uh, in this time period two and a half billion years ago, they were putting out oxygen during the daytime, but they were putting out hydrogen and methane at night. And that hydrogen and methane goes up to the top of the atmosphere, the hydrogen escapes, and you have a net oxidation. Right. So right. what do you think might be the contribution or the balance between the oxidation of the atmosphere by the loss of hydrogen to space versus the photosynthetic production of molecular oxygen? Um, so you want a quantitative answer? <laughs> uh, any, any kind of answer you want to try given? I, I, I don't even have a qualitative feel. I mean, I mean, the loss of hydrogen to space, and it's, you know, there are a lot of ideas. You know, Lee Kump is here uh, online. There are a lot of good ideas. Lee's been author of, of, of one of the better ones um, uh, uh, of, of what actually was changing to cause a change of oxygen. Um, the one thing that we do know goes on is loss of hydrogen to space, right? And so um, that's one that we can't avoid. But uh, to actually try to quantify the relative importance, uh, you know, of, of the various processes involved, you know, tough problem. Maybe Lee would like to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a good reason to hide. <laughs> I didn't mean to put no, you on the spot, man. <laughs> I think Jim's the one who might want to comment on that. <laughs> I have a potential postdoc who wants to work on that problem. Yeah. <laughs> Colin Goldblatt. So, so, Carl, for a little bit of money, you can get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hear you. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going once, going twice for asking Ariel questions or continuing this discussion. Okay, Ariel, I guess we will thank you again for a great talk. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate it. Okay, remember the next director seminar is, I think, four weeks from today. December 3rd, and it will be by Jeff Marcy, and we're going to be hearing about low-mass extrasolar planets. So uh, come back that time. Bye for now.